So, uh, a while ago, I was at a speaker workshop, and they told me what you should never do on stage is uh, add disclaimers to your talk or say that you're not an expert, because then no one's going to believe you. I'm going to do both today. I'm going to start with a disclaimer, and then I'm going to uh, tell you that I'm not an expert. So, I hope you'll still believe me in the end. Um, so, first, a disclaimer. If you've ever been to one of my talks, most of them have been highly technical. And what that means for me is that I try to stick as close as I can to the facts or to something that some people believe in called an objective truth? Well, not today. Today I'm also going to give you my opinion. And this means that you may disagree with me, that you have a different perspective, that you have different ideas about security and the role of a developer in security, and that's fine. Please come see me after my talk, and we can have a lovely conversation, and maybe I can learn something from you. So, today I am going to give you my opinion. Uh, the second thing is, I am not a security expert. So this may surprise you, I'm going to talk about security, but I am a software developer. So this is not only a, a, a guide for developers, it's also a guide by a developer. I am a developer that is very interested in security. I love to advocate security, I love to champion security, I love to raise um, security awareness, but everything that I'm going to say today is from the perspective of a developer. So I am not an expert, so you don't have to believe a word that I'm going to tell you today. Well, let's start with the talk itself. So today, the most important question that I would like to answer, and it is really a very simple question, is just why are developers so important for security? Now, this may seem like an obvious question. Developers write a lot of the code that's being used. So if developers write insecure code, then probably the security is going to be bad. But if you ask security experts who look at this question from a different perspective, they typically argue that developers are not so uh, important for security. They don't say that developers shouldn't be important for security, but they say that developers currently are not as important for security as they should be. In fact, some go even further. I was reading an article a while ago, and it had this very interesting quote. You know how it goes. Mention security to your typical developer, and you're likely to be met with an eye roll. At best, or puzzlement at worst. Generally, the whole security thing is seen as someone else's problem. This is quite a quote to have in your article. And I didn't cherry pick it either. This is uh, below a header that basically says the same, and this security expert goes on for two more paragraphs, basically making this same point over and over again. And this isn't an isolated article either. Uh, I typically, I, I watch a lot of security conferences, and especially in uh, like the, 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 the panel sessions, there are typically security experts who make similar statements, that developers, they don't really seem to care about security. Well. If I look at myself as a developer, I do care about security. So what is going on here? So I think we have to ask ourselves a different question. Why do developers behave as if they don't care about security? I think this is a really important question to ask ourselves. And for me, when I take a step back and look at my work and look at what I'm being paid to do, I think we can find a reason there. Because I, as a developer, I am paid to deliver value, some kind of business value, to deliver features, to deliver a new release. So my entire environment is basically telling me we should release soon, we need these features, we need to have this competitive advantage, you need to deliver this business value. Now over the past 20 years or so, if Uncle Bob is to be believed, developers have actually change their behavior. They, they are now, most of them are now writing automated unit tests or an automated testing suite. They care about maintainability. They use good design patterns. And they will even argue for that with a product owner, with a product manager, with the people telling them to deliver soon. Or, if you want to rephrase it, they use their technical or their professional responsibility to argue for the quality of the features they deliver. But this is difficult. So why don't developers do the same for security? I think to understand that, we have to take a trip to a different industry, and it's the safety industry, the industrial safety industry. And there they have a very neat term, and it's called safety culture. And what this means is that, well, everyone knows that safety is important because otherwise things blow up, but knowing that safety is important isn't enough. 
And you shouldn't do safety just to meet the regulations, to be compliant. What you should do is you should make sure that everyone believes that safety is important, that everyone acts like safety is important, and that everyone prioritizes safety. This is what a good, having a good safety culture means in, an, uh, in, a, in a company. And for companies, this is really important, because if you screw this up, something bad might happen, like your company blowing up. This was a big industrial accident in the Netherlands 10 years ago. This company no longer exists. So they had a bad safety culture, that's what all the reports say. They had a big accident and it was just the end of the company. So now in the security world, we have a similar term and it's a security culture. And what this means is that if you have a good security culture, then it's not only the CTO who says, well, all my developers are writing secure code, so come by with us. It's not only uh, the promotion, it's not only compliance to check all the checkboxes, but what this means is if you have a good security culture, then people really truly internalize the importance of security. And they will argue for it, they will change their behavior for it, they will prioritize it. It doesn't mean that you have to have perfect security, because that is impossible, but you do have to be very aware of the kind of risks that you're taking and the kind of impact that certain vulnerabilities may have in you, or certain threats may have in your, um, uh, in your company. But there is a bit of a difference with industrial safety. And that is that if you have a big security incident in your company, it may not have the same financial impact. So if we just go back one year, there was a series of data breaches as LastPass, which is right in, the core, in their core domain. They say, give us your secrets, we will keep them safe. And then they had a string of data breaches. Now, I cannot look into their culture and organization. I don't know if they have a good safety culture, so I don't want to comment on that. But what I do want to show is that this company is still in business. And I think they had a dip in the number of customers they have, but I think they're actually uh, going back up again. So if you look in a security perspective, having uh, an incident that goes right to the core of your core domain might not even be the end of your company. So there are less financial incentives to invest a lot in, in security. Um, regulators have caught on, so in Europe there are now regulations that if you have a data breach you have to pay a hefty fine, and those fines can be millions of euros uh, in total, so they're trying to create that financial incentive, but there is still a bit of a difference uh, in safety, in, uh, between safety culture and security culture. So why are developers so important? Well, I think that developers are important because we have to take our professional responsibility. So if we are, uh, we have uh, our responsibility for our work and we have to argue for it. And this is often a bit of a no negotiation. You have a project manager, you have a product owner, they come to you, we want to release next week, can you do that? And then you say, well, uh, um, if we do that, we have to cut these corners, so bad or not, and then you start up the conversation. But someone has to argue for security. And because developers are typically the people who are involved for the longest in that development process, I think there's a responsibility for developers to stand up for security culture, for security, to argue for that. It's part of your professional responsibility. But that's difficult, because if you want to argue for security, you have to be an expert in it, right? So to improve the security, you have to be a security expert. And this is a big problem. Because if I look at myself, if I want to become an expert in anything, it's prob probably in developing software. I also do a bit of ops, I uh, do a bit of security, uh, sometimes I do a bit of front-end development, if it's really necessary. Um, <laughs> but I cannot be an expert in everything. So. This is a problem, and I think a, a recent tweet by Kelsey Hightower illustrates this uh, principle very well. We cannot expect developers to become an expert in everything. That idea just isn't sustainable. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this as developers? How are we going to make the change in development? Well, today, I'm here to tell you that, well, you. You see that hole there, that check of the gun that's, that needs to go off. You don't have to become a security expert you can actually contribute to security without becoming an expert. But how do you do that without feeling lost? Well, I think there is a very, very good initiative within the security world that, that's there to help us. In the security world, there is the principle of shift left. 
And what that means is, well, they kind of use a caricature of the past to sell this, just like how, how Agile uses a caricature of Waterfall to sell the benefits of Agile. In the security world, they say, we used to do security very late in the process. So we used to do it at the end. Developers weren't involved, design, we didn't really care about security design. We did it in the end, we hired a team of pen testers, we found a million vulnerabilities, then we had to go back, releases had to be delayed, we had to rewrite stuff, redesign stuff, a lot of costs associated with it. So we shouldn't do that, we should take security and shift it left. Now obviously if you just take security and shift it left and then don't care about security after, that's also not good. So actually some people are arguing for start left, so you should consider security throughout your entire software development life cycle. So and why is that important for us? This means that now a lot more people are writing resources that tell you how to do security as a developer. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. And that is really important for us developers. We can just look at resources online and all of the things that we can do, they are not rocket science. Nothing that I'm going to tell you today is rocket science. You don't have to be an expert to implement them. And that is basically what I'm going to tell you in the rest of my talk. I'm going to tell you how you can navigate that landscape, how you can learn about security, how you can apply that in your work without feeling overwhelmed. So why is that important? Well, let's zoom in on the first security principle that I want to show you today. And it's a term called defense in depth. It's typically illustrated with a castle. And what this means is that if you want to do security well, you, you cannot rely on a single security measure. So here you have a castle, and if you look at this castle, you have a moat. So if you want to get into castle, you first have to cross the moat. Then you have to get past the wall. Uh, and then you're in the inner courtyard, but all the treasures are in the actual castle, which is a fortification unto itself, so you still have to make it into the castle. There are guards everywhere, rooms are locked, so you have multiple layers of security. This is what defense in depth means. And this also illustrates why developers are important. A lot of companies these days, they buy a vendor, a, 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 an on-premise cloud environment, they invest a lot in edge security, so if, not, if nothing gets into your systems, then we're safe, right? But the problem <laughs> is every layer has holes. So if we ignore the part in the middle where the developers write the applications, we can still get in. So that is why in a true start left or shift left environment, developers are very important. In the safety industry, they typically uh, illustrated with this model, this is the Swiss cheese model by James Reason. Uh, I'm not really going to go into it, but there is one important point to make here. In this model, you have various barriers between normal and a disaster, or in our case, a security breach. And the realization is that there are always holes and barriers. So in software, you might have a zero-day vulnerability, just lying to wait there for someone to pick it up. You might have a misconfigured firewall. Um, and we call those things latent conditions. There are holes that are always there in your system. But you might also have active failures. For instance, you might have a user of your system handing out their pass password in a phishing attack, handing them the keys to an application. So in this model, and I think that's really cool, you have latent conditions and active failures. There are holes in your system everywhere. But once those holes align, that's when we need to get in. And that is why developers are important. We are responsible for some of those layers and we should implement them. This is enough about industrial safety. If you want to know more, this is a good book which has a lot of overlap with security. It's a nice book to read. So what can you do to prevent those holes in your project? And this isn't rocket science. I'm not going to tell you anything that's really difficult, but I'm just going to show you how I do it. So in my opinion, for me, there are three main pillars. And the first thing is that you have to learn about secure design principles. And I don't mean about big architecture principles that you have to design into your system, but coding patterns, just like you learn about repositories and, and observer patterns and stuff like that. There are also secure coding patterns that help you keep your code and application secure. Look into them, practice with them. The second thing is, there are a lot of mature security practices these days. Look into them, adopt them. They're often very easy. A lot of them are automated, which I love as a developer. There are a lot of tools that we can use. Use those tools, get familiar with them. And finally, know how to mitigate common vulnerabilities. And this one is really important. There are a lot of top 10 lists out there, but I'm, I'm going to tell you later that that is not enough. 
So these are main, my main three pillars. Now, for the first, I'm not really going to take you through a long list of design principles. I'm sure you can all Google. Uh, it would be a bit of a waste of our time to go past everyone. I've selected a few here. Uh, the, the extra cards under, under validate input indicates that there are a lot more to find. Uh, but I do want to zoom in on uh, the first one. And this is one that I've encountered in production a lot of times. I sometimes do code reviews for other projects. Uh, and this is the no unless principle. And if there's one thing that if you go home that you should check is if you're doing no unless or deny by default, which is a, a different name for the same thing. So what am I talking about? Well, let's say that you're using a nice API framework in Python. If you create an API endpoint in Python, it's really easy in most frameworks, like Fast API, Django, Flask. You just write a function or a class, you map a route to it, and hooray, everything works. But what this means is if you just create an endpoint, it is open by default. There's no authentication, there's no authorization. And this also means if, that someone, if someone refactors your code down the line, and you have no mitigations in place, during that refactor, the decorator may accidentally disappear. Or someone has a really complicated feature to build with a lot of business logic, and everyone is focused on the functionality, and then they forget to add that base class to the inheritance list of the class. So if you have a, a yes unless and you forget something, then suddenly something is open. So what I typically try to do is I try to invert that. It's deny by default unless there is something that gives someone access. And this is a principle that you can do today. And this is one that I think I've reviewed five or six projects over the last two years. This was present in at least four of them. Most were minor, one was very major. So. Um, the second thing that I want to talk about is mature security practices. And this, again, is going to be an introduction in how you can learn about mature security practices because I can talk about this for two hours and I only have about 11 minutes left. Um, so mature security practices mean that you just have practices uh, that help you enhance security. So how do you know what they are? Well, luckily, in the security industry, people love standards. And we as a developer, we don't have to look at standards to see if we're compliant but we can use them as a guide. Now, not every standard is as accessible to us developers uh, uh, as the other one. So if you look at this slide, I've, I've made a kind of like a hierarchy of standards in terms of high level abstractness to low level close to the doing. And I'm going to show you one that's really close to the doing that basically just tells you, you can do this and your project is more secure. So right at the top, there's one that maybe some of you already know, which is an ISO standard 27001. And this is really abstract. If you look at this standard in detail, it doesn't really tell me what to do as a developer. I can't take the rules from this standard to my work floor and know what to do. Luckily, below that, there's a model called the Software Assurance Maturity Model, or SAM for short. This is by an organization called OASP. They recently rebranded from uh, the open web application security pr uh, program to the open worldwide application security program, just to highlight that it's not just about web development. Um, and I really like this organization because of their logo. They're called OWASP, so their logo is a WASP inside of an O, which I think is really cool. So if you look at this model, you'll find something like create a formal definition of the build process so that it becomes consistent and repeatable. Now, this is already more concrete. As a developer, I can already kind of imagine what I can do to make my builds more secure. But it's still a little bit removed from the actual practices that I have to do. And that's why there is a fairly recent project, which is the OWASP DevSecOps maturity model. Now, DevSecOps is just DevOps plus Sec, um, or DSOM for short, and this is much closer to the doing still. So in the uh, in the uh, DSUM model, you might find a practice that maps to the build process like pinning of artifacts. You do have to learn the security lingo a little bit, but if you pin your artifacts, your dependencies, the images that you're using, that is one way to ensure that your build is more repeatable. So if you zoom in on that project, you're going to find a lot of practices that you can just do today. Um, I do have to mention I adapted this sheet from a talk by Timo Pagel. I asked for permission and he was okay. He's one of the leads on that model. Um, I do want to show you a little bit what's in that model. So if we zoom in on the OWASP DevSecOps maturity model, how can you use it as a guide? 
That's actually a really simple model. You can just look it up online. It has five dimensions. Um, and again, the disclaimer, the terminology here is slightly different than how we use it as developers. So testing and verification is mostly about verifying and testing security, although unit tests are also in there. Um, but if you then zoom into one of those dimensions, like build and deployment, you'll find sub-dimensions, build, deployment, patch management. They are really familiar to us. And if you then look at something like patch management, you're going to get a hierarchy of practices that you can do today uh, that you can just implement in your workflow. So here are a number of practices rated against several maturity levels. Now, I've heard that some security experts don't really like the gaps in this because that messes with their scores. But for me as a developer, I don't really care about that. I can just look at this and say, hey, what's, what do we mean by nightly builds? And should I do them? And I can look up what nightly builds are. And a bit of a spoiler, they're not the nightly builds that I was used to when I was younger. I grabbed the latest nightly build of a Linux distro and wrecked my computer every day. Uh, what they mean by this is if you have a build pipeline, just run it every night. You don't have to actually go to deployment, but most of your automated tooling, security scanners, dependency scanners, they are in your pipeline. And if you have a long running service that you rarely update, chances are that you've not run your build pipeline for weeks, sometimes months. So just schedule a pipeline run every night and make sure that if your scanners now fail because the security definitions have been updated, that you get an alert in the morning so you know that you have some work to do. And this is a very simple practice that you can start doing today. And now, for those long-running applications, you just get alerts about outdated dependencies and stuff like that. There are also related techniques in here like automated patch PRs, but these are really simple things that you can do. There are also some dimensions in here that you might not check out as a developer, and I urge you, urge you to do so anyway. So this is the culture and organization, and then specifically the design sub-dimension. This mostly has to do with stuff uh, uh, like how are you going to make sure that you, you design secure, securely in your organization, and you might not feel as uh, familiar with this as a developer. But there is a technique in here, it's called simple threat modeling, which I think is really important and everyone should check out. What this means is that if you're in a very early stage of your project, you should just think about what are the threats that, uh, that are potentially in this project. How severe are those threats? What is the impact? What is the risk? And then you can get an idea of the things that you should think about while designing your application, while implementing your application. I say ideally you, you do such a workshop with a security expert who knows how to run these. But if you don't have one, just do it yourself. Grab a whiteboard, start draw, drawing your routes and your relationships between your services, and just analyze what are the vulnerable bits and make sure that your design counteracts that. And not only at the start, if you're going to make a major change, please do another threat modeling session. So for instance, if you run a web shop and you're expecting a Christmas sale and you expect a big run on your website and you want to make your website more performant and you're going to change all your caching rules, do another threat modeling session. What are the threats there? Should we mitigate some stuff? Should we build in tests to uh, 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 not cache too, too much things? Because if you don't, you might end up like Steam. They were heading to their one of their famous Christmas sales. Someone ramped up all the caching and they started caching individual account pages which meant that if customer A was the first in the caching period, they added stuff to their shopping cart, then the next customer would see the, the shopping cart of the previous customer. What's worse, if this happens with credit card information, if you visit your own payment information and you see that of the previous visitor, that's obviously not a good idea. So you can make a threat model, you can analyze what is the sensitive information, what is uh, the not so sensitive information, what is it that we can cache? And you can take steps to prevent failures. Don't rely on memory. You can build a sec security integration test that just verifies that you're not caching something sensitive so that if someone a year later changes the config, you don't make the same mistake. But in a threat modeling session, you can think about such changes. Um, well, and finally, no common vulnerabilities. I think this one is pretty obvious. Uh, there are a lot of top 10 lists out there that list the most common vulnerabilities. Now, I hope 
None of you are just formatting in raw uh, arguments into your SQL statements. Uh, so I do urge you to dive a little bit deeper into all those vulnerabilities. I also urge you not to stay passive. I don't really like reading passive lists, but there are a lot of challenge websites out there that have a vulnerable website and they ask you, find the vulnerability. And that's a great way to not only get to know the vulnerability, but to also see the impact. And a lot of those websites also have common techniques to mitigate those vulnerabilities. So don't reinvent the wheel. And finally, and I think this personally, this is the most important one, if there are vulnerabilities that are identified within your own projects, share them with your colleagues. Don't be afraid, don't shame each other, don't put the blame on each other. But if there are certain vulnerabilities that in your domain are especially important, it's important to talk about them. And that is probably one of the most important things. If you're handling a lot of PII, personally identifiable information, and you've noticed that you're logging that in production and it goes to vendors, that's a data breach, personal information is now with another company, you've lost control over your information. If you discover that, talk about it to other developers because they may be doing the same thing. So that is really important. Um, well, and to wrap it up, if you do want to implement stuff, take it slow. Don't add six security scanners to your pipeline overnight because the only thing that you're going to teach yourself is how to ignore those millions of alerts that you're getting. So take it slow, take it one step at a time. You don't want to teach people how to ignore good security advice. You also have to be pragmatic and it's kind of related to the first point. You don't have to be here. You don't have to compare yourself with the biggest companies out there. But if you're currently here, work on getting to this maturity level first. Be pragmatic about it and also always make a cost-benefit analysis. That's what your threat modeling is for. And also be vocal. We can only truly build a security culture if we do it together. If you talk to your fellow developers, if you organize a capture the flag, exploit this vulnerability workshop together, do stuff so that you make security a topic that is talked about in your company. And if you're uh, confident, do also talk about it with people higher up in the company so that you also get the support from your product managers, from your product uh, owners, from your CTOs out there. So be vocal. And that's all we have time for today. This was me. The slides are available on Discord in the talk slides and artifacts channel or whatever it's called. And thank you very much. <laughs>